All right. Hey, imagine everybody one year from now, June 22nd, 2022, you were sitting at your desk and you're like, everything I've rolled out this year has worked. Everyone's done everything that I wanted them to do. Everyone has adopted all of my new technologies. I can't believe it. It's been the best year of my life. I've thought of all of these new things. Salesforce has rolled out these new features and my users have been crowding around saying, I want to do it too. How can I do that? Well, guess what? I am going to give you some tips today that will help you to come along and bring your users with you so that you can blaze your trail with innovation influence. So no longer are the days where you will say, okay, I've got some really cool technology to roll out, but I just don't know how to influence people to do it. All right, so in the diffusion of innovations cycle, I'm going to teach you how to take these things and work them along so that all of the people that you would like to be using your Salesforce technologies, your Salesforce adjacent technologies, and all of the amazing new features that you instill based on the three new releases that Salesforce gives you every year, they will be clamoring for more. They will be saying to you, what's coming next? No longer will you be receiving that, no way, I don't wanna change the way I do it because I'm gonna give you the tips and tricks today. They're gonna to help you to understand and pull them along with great fervor. <laughs> so why should you listen to me? Yes, Bradley, thank you for introducing me in such a manner, but it is true. I do have a doctorate in Salesforce. This is something that I am really excited to share with you today, give you some insights and some of the tips and tricks that I know from my research. I've been working on the Salesforce platform for almost a dozen years now. And one of the things that I was really have always been focused on with a sales operations background is how can I help these users because they are who Salesforce is for, right? We sit around and we think, how can we make flows? How can we make custom objects? How can we really make our integrations powerful? And it's so that people can do their job better, more efficiently, more effectively. And so I thought about it for a really long time and I I said, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to undertake some research. And one of the things you do when you do research in a PhD program is first, you research other people's research. Well, guess what, you guys? There was no research out there that was how to get more people to adopt Salesforce. So I had to cobble together three seminal theories to research other people's research before I went and did my own primary research. And so you can see my dissertation topic there. There are so many words, but I will break it down for you really quickly. <laughs> so you can say, all right, these tips and tricks, while they're rooted in academic theory, I can put them into practice immediately, starting today, June 22nd, 21, so that on June 22nd, 22, you are feeling so excited about the things that you've learned because you've put them into action. You already know how to do the technical stuff, right? So I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks that are based on my primary research that was in change management, adult learner theory, and diffusion of innovations. And excitingly today, I've got some brand new stuff for you that ties together influence. That is the Achilles heel of the Salesforce practitioner. We love Salesforce so stinking much that it is impossible for us to imagine somebody else may not, right? We know that we've got really cool ways to use Salesforce. All the presentations today have been phenomenal. Everybody's talking about how to bend Salesforce so that your users get what they want out of it. This is an incredible platform. We love it. How do we get the people that we are working with to become foaming at the mouth and as excited as we are? I'm gonna give you those tips today. So first, let's start with this important diffusion of innovations bell curve. I want you to understand this, and if you've listened to my research before, you've heard this, but I'm going to take this and apply it to something that is brand new today that is going to allow you to run right back to your office after this amazing day at Send Cal Dreamin and say, guess what? I've got ways to make you love Salesforce as much as I do. Maybe not for the same reasons, but as much as I do. So in this traditional bell curve, and it's a really beautiful shape, Everett Rogers put this out in the 60s. This is such a seminal theory, though, that it's been repurposed five different times. So they keep adding to the research here because it just works. 
Anytime you roll out a new idea, a new theory, a new methodology, a new technology, it goes through this diffusion of innovations curve. So very basically, this is the how, the why, and the what of how new ideas and technology spread, how they spread through an organization, how they spread through a society, how they go to market. And really what you're trying to do as a Salesforce practitioner, whenever you've got something new that you've developed, whether you're an administrator, you're a developer, you're an architect, you've got an idea that you need other people to glom onto because a brand new beautiful piece of technology that sits in a cavern all by itself doesn't do anybody any good, right? That's what your dev org is for. So understanding the diffusion of innovations curve will allow you to put into place the things I'm going to teach you today on how you can get people excited for you. So understand first, 2.5% of the people are going to be innovators. They want to break what you just built because they like it. This is probably most of you actually. Most of you in the audience are like, that's me. Yep, I love to break things. I like to say, hey Salesforce, I just broke you. <laughs> because it means that you're doing your job and you understand it. Following right behind them are the early adopters. These people love new things. They love to go to the new restaurants. They love to try things out because it's a new piece of technology. I gotta tell you, when my friends at Bitwire showed me this technology they were using for this event platform today, my, my jaw dropped open because it was new and exciting and I just could not wait to see more of it. And I hope you feel the same way too. So you know these people, these are the ones that you love to have in your organization. The 68% in the middle of your majority, they're gonna do it because they have to do it. They're gonna do it because they start to see evidence that it makes sense. They're gonna do it because everyone else is. These are most of your users. So I'm going to give you the tips and tricks that will help them today. Following along at the end are the laggards. They are your energy vampires. I want to encourage you to not spend too much time on the laggards when all of these things I'm going to tell you today, these seven principles of influence are going to eventually make their way to them. So as you're plotting out, how am I going to get the summer one, 21 release brand new pieces into the hands of my users? these laggards are gonna come along too. So I really want you to be thinking about and understanding this diffusion of innovations bell curve as you plot out how you're gonna take these seven pillars of influence and apply them, okay? So we're gonna get into what I think is the good stuff. Here we go. So there are four main elements that are inside of the diffusion of innovations. Again, this is just how does a new idea spread? How do people get a hold of that? The four main elements are the innovation, the communication channels, so how they get the information you're trying to get to them, the time, the amount of time that it takes, or what is time bound, how it gets there, and the last one is their social system. What we're gonna talk about today is how to apply those four things, but especially time, because that's what's critical, so that you can pull your users along with you, okay? So we're gonna focus primarily on the time element and how you can impact and influence other people. But Shannon, you're saying, how can I influence or impact these people? I don't manage them. I don't control them. In fact, we've all been working from home, so I don't even see them. How am I going to do this? What do you mean influence? You can. <laughs> Stay with me because I'm going to give you the ways to do it and it's going to work. We're going to talk a lot today about research that is, it has been rooted in uh, social influence research since 1984, but the guy who wrote it, Dr. Cialdini, he just released a brand new edition that's got 200 more pages and really reflects the technological age that we're in today. So you will have the principles that will help you figure out, here's exactly how I can do that. Within the innovation decision process, and that sounds super fancy, right? You're like, let's put on our fancy clothes, and think about the innovation decision process. Guess what? It isn't. This is just a critical decision point where somebody says, am I going to listen to you or am I not going to listen to you, right? Rachel's coming at me telling me I've got all this new stuff in Salesforce. Do I want to do it? Check out that kid there, right? That kid is like, no, thank you. I do not want that broccoli. I don't care how good it is for me. You can tell me all those stories, but it doesn't look good. It doesn't smell good. And it definitely doesn't taste good. So I'm not going to do it. Well, in the innovation decision process, as anybody from a stubborn six-year-old to a stubborn 60-year-old thinks about whether or not they're going to use an innovation, they go through five stages, knowledge, persuasion, the decision, the implementation, and then the confirmation. 
We're going to focus entirely today on persuasion because so many of the people who are in the Salesforce ecosystem are great, brilliant, amazing technical minds who know how to make things work. If you go to them and say, hey, I'm having a little problem here. I am trying to create an opportunity and it needs a hundred different locations. How do I do that without creating a hundred opportunities? You know how to solve that problem. In fact, right now you're saying, mm -hmm, Shannon, I know how to do that. I can fix that problem. Yes, you can. Persuasion is the hard part for us. Anybody usually who is saying, I don't have direct influence over these people, but I know how to make good technology often struggles with this concept. So how can we fix this? How can we get these people where we want them to go so that they can say, mm hmm yep, I'm gonna do exactly what you're saying because it makes good sense. You've built great technology. You're optimizing it in the right way. I wanna do it. The primary points we're gonna focus on here are the rate of adoption. How quickly can somebody be persuaded to use something new or use something the way that it's supposed to be used and this innovation decision process. So. The most challenging step that you're going to face is persuasion. That is everybody's Achilles heel. Let's get into how we are going to fix that today. So there are two amazing books. I already told you about this one. I read this one so much that I had to buy a second version of it. And this brand new one, this is, <laughs> this is a door stopper of a book, but I'm gonna give you all of the things that you need for today so that you don't have to read it and you can immediately say, here we go, I'm ready. I'm gonna roll all of these new things out. The primary focus that we have today is compound influence. I will give you these seven pillars, how Dr. Cialdini wrote them, and I'm gonna tell you how you can immediately apply them as a Salesforce professional, but don't just pick one. There's no such thing as influencing somebody by one of these pillars. It is a compound effect, right? So you're gonna reach into this toolkit and you're gonna say, yes, I'm building this Salesforce house. The foundation is beautiful. The platform works. We've got all of the things inside of it that we need. I have to fix it though. We well, are not only fixing a house with a screwdriver, right? You also need a hammer, a hammer drill, a sawzall. You need loads of tools. So I want you to think about this today as this is being introduced to you without saying like, yes, that is my one favorite thing. That's how I'm going to influence everybody. You need a combination of many of them, okay? So we're going to go through, we're going to find a couple of these and you are going to immediately put them into play and you are going to find out that your Salesforce users are going to be incredibly excited to use the technology that you have. So we've got seven and the first one we're going to start with is reciprocation. Reciprocation is the old give and take, right? You're familiar with the old give and take. You've seen this sort of compliance exchange in loads of places. You see it in politics, right? I will give you some money for one of your pet projects if you will vote this way. That's how the whole entire lobbying system is built, right? You've seen this in what I will call the not so free sample. If you've ever been to Costco or Sam's Club or any sort of membership club, as you're walking around, you'll see there are people there who are giving away free samples of things. And they may say, hey, you know, we've got over here, we've got these brand new breakfast bars. They're made of granola. They've got organic chocolate. You try it. Costco will tell you their sales of anything that they sample that day incrementally jump up because people feel like, wow, you gave me something for free. I better buy a little bit more. This is also similar to having gated content. So if we've got marketers in the room, if you say, I'll give you one free chapter of my book, sign up for this, trade me, however, your email address and permission to constantly being reached, reached out to, people will do it because they feel like, okay, now you're giving me something for free. I'm going to give you something in exchange. Robert Cialdini actually said when he first wrote his book, he was offering people chapters for free. And he found that the people that he offered it to had a 47% higher chance of buying his book than the people who didn't take the free chapter. So you understand how this reciprocation, this old give and take thing sort of works. One of the things that people love when it comes to reciprocation is personalization. So they want to feel like what you've done, what you've offered me, what you're customizing is just for me, right? So this, this reciprocation isn't something you're 
giving to a whole group of people. It's something that you're giving just to me because it creates that teeter-totter, right? That sort of social balance that says, okay, perfect. Jake gave me something and I have to, I have to keep that in my mind because what I don't want to be seen as is a freeloader. I have to remember that Jake did something for me, so I'm gonna have to do something for him too. Human beings are wired this way. We're the only social animal that is wired for this type of compliance exchange. So how can you use this to your advantage? If you're looking at this and saying, how can I make sure that my Salesforce users feel like they should reciprocate something for me? I have a few ideas for you. The first one that you can do is find out who you think would be motivated by custom one-on-one -on -one sessions. So in this example that I want to tell you, I was working with an executive, his name was Ron. Ron loved what Salesforce would give him as an output, but he never would log into Salesforce himself, right? He could never remember his password. He was too embarrassed to say so. He had loads of other demands on his plate. And so I said, hey, Ron, Tuesday, 5.15 p.m., I'm going to be in your office and I'm going to help you customize uh, a report that is going to show you all the things that you've been asking for that I know that you must go away and work in Excel on. I'm going to show you what list views are and we're going to sit down and we're going to customize this, customize this entirely to you, okay? So we sat down, went through the thing, and then three weeks later, there was another executive who was really struggling with Salesforce, wasn't logging in, was asking all of the salespeople to produce PowerPoint reports to say, here's what's happening in all of my key accounts. Here's all of my opportunity information, which was wasting tons of time from the sales user. I said, Ron, I'm going to need you to go over there and talk to your friend. You have to talk to Bill and you have to tell Bill here are some things that will work for you in Salesforce. Here are some ways that you can use Salesforce. And if you want some more help, talk to Shannon. She'll help you. She'll sit down. She'll customize this thing for you. So instead of you waiting for every Friday at 9.15 a.m. when all of your sales users send you their beautiful PowerPoint presentations that they spent three hours on with the same exact information you could have seen on your Salesforce mobile with one click at 2 a.m. if you wanted to on Tuesday morning, it's there. So it's a reduction of effort from everybody. Well, guess what? It worked. So Ron went and talked to Bill and he said, you know what? Here's some things I got to tell you about Salesforce because I had done him what he perceived to be a favor. That was a favor to everybody, right? Everybody benefited from the situation. So I want you to keep that in mind and think about that when you're thinking about reciprocation. The next thing I want you to think about with reciprocation is how you can personalize the UX based on persona. If you attended John Klein's session this morning, he gave you an exact recipe of how to do this. But this is another beautiful way to get somebody's favor so that you can gain their reciprocation. So you can say, okay, I know when you log into your home screen, the first thing you don't want to see is news because you're in customer success, right? The first thing you want to see is our customer retention rate, our customer lifetime value, and you want to see the renewals that are upcoming, right? Those are the things you want to see. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to help you make sure that this makes sense for you and everybody else who's in your role. We're going to give you a custom profile so that you can see this as soon as you log in. Because what a customer success person doesn't want to do is log into their home screen and see something that makes more sense for executives or sales users or marketing users, right? So when you start to build up what I will say is that sort of reciprocity capital, people remember that. And so when you go back to them and say, you know what, I need a little help because that word is going to be really powerful to you. So you can ask them, give me some help back. You don't even have to remind them. Remember that time I sat down and I gave you these things? They'll remember. We automatically catalog this as humans. Somebody's done you a favor. They jumped your car. They'll remember. If, if you need help, you're going to let them know, right? So I want you to also keep in mind that word because. Dr. Cialdini did some research and found that when people said, hey, I've got to get in front of you. I only have five sheets to copy. Can I jump in front of you on this Xerox machine? About 50% of the people would say, okay. If they said, hey, I've got to get in front of you because I'm in a hurry, the number of people who would do it jumped up. It jumped up to about 85%. Then he did one more experiment and found that the word because was the only one that mattered in that sentence. So people who then were the next set of experimenters said, I have to get in front of you because I have to make copies. 
Well, everybody who was waiting in line had to make copies, right? That's, that's something that, you, that they understood. But the word because would turn them around. So you can go back to that executive and say, hey, look, I really need your help trying to figure out how to open the minds of these other executives that I'm working with. So they'll start using Salesforce because our sales and service reps are more likely to use it when they know that our executives are in there every single day and can see the things that they're doing, right? So remember that word because, because that word because is going to be a really key piece of your strategy of getting people to come to your side. So many times Salesforce is seen as shadow IT, right? Shadow IT that is sort of owned in a department that, that maybe it doesn't only strictly belong to. You may be working in the IT department, the sales department, the marketing department, customer service. You could be sitting in probably any department. At, at one point I owned Salesforce and I was in finance. So it can sit anywhere. It's really hard for you to exert influence across the entire organization when your piece of technology, your application is sitting there everywhere. And this goes not only for end user Salesforce professionals, it also goes for consultants, right? Keep in mind that word because Vanessa said she owns Salesforce and legal ones. We can see it. It happens everywhere. So your appeal, your influence has to be universal. This is a challenge across all organizations, but particularly for us when we love this piece of software so much and we know it can ser serve everybody and we really need to make sure that it does. Okay. So that is the first one. Reciprocation, the old give and take. Keep that in mind and don't forget your magic word because. The next one is liking. Our second one is liking. And in liking, we see the friendly thief. <laughs> so <laughs> the friendly thief is somebody that comes in and says, all right, I totally understand it. I can see Sal. I have to think about Sal because Sal will always work with his emotion before he will think with logic. Everybody will. Everybody reacts with emotion before they think with logic. There's an old story about evolution, right? Evolution has been proven by every single scientist, every single piece of everything that everybody can find says, this makes sense, we all agree. And so um, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, you will find a group of people who will say, simply don't believe it. There may be some of you in the audience say, simply don't believe it. That's because emotionally we're very tied to a completely different story, right? So you could provide rational, logical arguments Hey, listen here, you late adopters. <laughs> listen here, you laggards. You should use Salesforce because when you do it your way, where you track everything in your Google Sheets, and then on Friday before your all hand sales meeting, you try to hurry up and enter everything into Salesforce. It doesn't make sense. You're doing duplicate data entry. You're forgetting things that your prospects said. You're not getting the right close date. You don't have the proper amount in the opportunity. They don't care. They don't care. Your logic does not appeal to their emotion. In this case, they're saying my beliefs, my values, my experiences, the things I already know, they're so much stronger than what you're trying to bring to me. So how can you combat that as a Salesforce professional? Well, one thing that you can use is this pillar of liking. People say yes to people that they like. People say yes to people that are like them, right? They look for similarities. So you can say, hey, look, I know we're rolling out a brand new product next month. We've all got a little stress and pressure because of it. You want that product to, to succeed. I want that product to succeed. We've got the same goals. We want the same outcomes. I'm going to ask your help with these following things, right? They're going to like that you want the same things as they do. The other thing that you can use here is praise. The two best types of praise that you can use are praise behind somebody's back. And this has to be truthful. <laughs> I know it says the friendly thief, but I don't want you to think that it's not truthful. It has to be truthful. So praise behind somebody's back and advanced praise. So here in this case, with advanced praise, one of the things that you could do, you could think about, you could say, all right, John, I know you. I know that you're somebody that likes to try new things. I know you're somebody that doesn't mind saying, you know what, we learned something from this, it wasn't the right thing, let's make a little change. I know that about you already, John. So one of the things that I need to ask you is, can you help me with this brand new Salesforce initiative that we have, no matter how small? So whenever you give somebody advanced praise that says, I know something about you, and you give them that praise, they're likely to live up to it, right? They want, they want to be liked and they want to like you. 
That is just the nature of the human. And then the other thing to think about is how contact and cooperation breeds familiarity that helps drive people to like you. So this is often challenging for us, and especially with the pandemic, it's really hard. But one of the ways that you can do this is to think about, hmm, how can I breed a little familiarity? Is there a project that you're working on that I can get in on and I can listen so I can see if there's a way that I can be helpful to you? Is there a town hall? Are we all getting together? Is there a team building exercise where I can stand by you instead of the same five people I usually stand by, right? So driving familiarity by, you know, coordinated contact, that will help you to develop that relationship. This is, this is just a skill that will help somebody say, you know what? I recognize you, Salesforce professional. I know what you're trying to do. I know that you've got great intentions and I like that. I like that about you. I like that you're trying to do the things that are right for this organization. You can also think about contacts who have connections to them that they like, some assimilation that they like. So if your number one sales rep is Jordan, and Jordan, everybody likes Jordan because Jordan does things right. Jordan has amazing sales. Jordan has all of the best things that all salespeople you like. You can use that as an example and say, you know what Jordan's seen? Jordan has seen opportunity value drive up 12% by converting leads following this procedure that we've seen instead of immediately adding people as contacts or instead of tracking everything on post-it notes and then entering it in three weeks when he feels like it's a pretty hot opportunity. So if you can expose them to somebody that they already like, you can actually gain some of that liking. You can be that friendly thief <laughs> just by using association with somebody that they already like and trust. All right, the third one, the next one we've got is social proof. Social proof is so key. And believe it or not, this one actually was in the 1984 edition of the book. You know, I think social proof is something that is uh, really interesting because we think about it in, when we're thinking about influencers, right? So if you're thinking about social media influencers, you understand the concept of social proof, although it's been a long, around for a lot longer than social media has. So in this one, you want to think about truth for us. Here, humans, social animals, are looking for the correct behaviors. We're looking to say, what is the correct thing to do? What is everybody else doing? What is Julian doing that I can do too? Because I think Julian's probably doing the right thing, so I want to join along. And so here, we're looking to say, what are other people's doing? So if you've ever used DoorDash or Uber Eats, you see a lot of times at the top it says, here's our most popular dish. Well, Restaurants that say this is our most popular dish find that that dish sells more than any other dish simply because they say it's our most popular dish. That's it. So humans are looking for social proof. They want to say, I want to see evidence of behavior that other people are undertaking, right? So there are three optimizers in here that you can use to your benefit when you're trying to get people on your side to do things in your Salesforce instance. The first one is uncertainty. So there is a look for uncertainty. When things are uncertain, conformity grows. If you can think back to, if anybody can remember 2008, there was an economic downturn. Well, if you were tracking user adoption at that time of your Salesforce system, you would have found that because it was a period of uncertainty, am I gonna keep my job? Am I gonna keep my house? Am I gonna be able to do all the things I'm used to doing? people start to comply even more. So when things become uncertain, compliance grows. So here you may say, okay, I know that people have some sort of uncertainty and we can use social proof to help overcome that. The next is the many. What are the many doing? How can we stand on our sidewalk with the friends and look up? If you're doing that, you could try this. Go stand on the sidewalk with four of your friends and have everybody look up and guess what's gonna happen? people will walk by and they'll start looking up with you. And they won't know what they're looking up at. They don't know what you're looking up at and you're just trying to see if they'll follow along with you and they will do it. They will all look up at you. So as people start to see social proof, they'll start to do the things you want them to more. This is the number one reason why I say use Salesforce as much as you can. If you are having a company-wide meeting, pull up Salesforce, pull up your live dashboards. Don't show them on a PowerPoint show them this is exactly what it looks like live 
if somebody needs to make a change to one of their close dates or the opportunity probability, do it right in the middle of the sales meeting and your pipeline meeting. Don't wait until later, do it in front of everybody. Develop that sort of culture where people will do that because once they see their friends doing it, they're gonna do it as well. So there you get to take the benefit of the many. The next is similarity. So remember I told you, you can't use just one of these, you can use many. Remember in liking, people were also looking for similarity. So here was social proof. People were saying, what are people like me doing? What are other people in the sales department doing? What are other people in finance doing? And they're, they're bound to do the same sort of thing because they will see this is the conformity piece that we're looking for. We want to use the same way as everybody else because people intrinsically want to do a good job and they intrinsically want to do the right thing. So here your keyword, <laughs> you remember your keyword um, in reciprocation was because, here your keyword is help. If you insert the word help, if you ask somebody for help, the chances that they'll help you, they're gonna drive way up. They're gonna drive way, way up. So you can say, you know what? I need to ask you for some help. Or I'd like to ask you for some help. Why isn't anybody using the new app that we installed? Why isn't anybody using that? Can you help me? Help me understand that. People are generally going to do it. The next thing you can do is use the word most of, many of, or people just like you are seeing success when they enter their opportunities into Salesforce right when they're on the call. Here's how you can do that too. Or you can say, this is my favorite one, persuasion. Get their peers to do it for you, right? So this is where you say, I need your help, Jordan. I know you're using Salesforce really well and your results are really good. Can you help me persuade your peers? <laughs> Because we need to bring them along with us. Okay, so they love those average person testimonials. Pay attention for that sort of thing. You'll see them all the time on television. People just like you have done this and has worked for them. So that was the third one, social proof. Those are the truths are us. We're going to move into the fourth one, which is authority. Authority is an interesting one that you will use sparingly. So this is directed deference. Uh, a lot of us talk about the carrot and the stick approach, and I'm sure you've all seen where somebody's written into a commission plan. If you don't have it in Salesforce, if you don't track the whole entire opportunity path in Salesforce, you don't get your commission. That one's a little bit challenging. I want to give you some of the ways that Dr. Cialdini says you can use authority and you can apply these to the way that you use Salesforce first people are looking for decision-making shortcuts, okay? They're looking for ways to say, how can I quickly make a decision that I think is going to benefit me and everybody else that I'm around? And authority is a really good way to do that. So this will help to trigger compliance. There are three primary things that will trigger compliance and you already understand what authority is, but a quick definition is titles. Titles help to signify authority. The next is clothes, the way that people are dressed. You've surely heard, you know, dress for the position you want and not necessarily the position that you have. Um, I'm glad to say in technology and in 2021, things have changed a little bit, but human beings are still sort of looking for that. So somebody in a suit is more likely to sell you something than somebody in a pair of sweatpants. And trappings, so the things that go around it you know, really nice pens, <laughs> very nice vehicles, those sorts of things say this person is a person of authority and a level of trust is automatically assumed here. So how can you do this? What are some examples of ways you can do this? One, my favorite story is Michael Dell at Dell Computers. You know about Dell. So Michael Dell said, I'm gonna be the number one user of Salesforce. And in fact, when Salesforce rolled out Chatter, Chatter was something that Dell Computers said, we're gonna use this all the time. Here's how we're gonna use it. We're gonna get inside of it. And Michael Dell said, I'm gonna be the number one user of Chatter at Dell. And therefore I'm gonna be logging into Salesforce all of the time, so I'm gonna see everything you're doing. Well, guess what that did? It immediately drove compliance and adoption because Michael Dell is the authority at Dell Computing. And not only did it work inside of that organization, it worked at every other organization who had executives and users who recognized Michael Dell's authority. So there's a transference of authority here. So you can find stories like this and you can say, okay, here's what we know about. I know if you are looking to get yourself a new certification and you say, you know what, maybe not, I don't know, I'm scared, I'm anxious, perhaps I'm a little too old, I immediately will tell you about Steph Rhodes, right? She works at a rental car company. She was 65 when she got her first certification. So I'll immediately say, guess what? 
well, she's not a common household name. She's an authority because she is a person who said, I'm going to change my career late in life. Okay. So I want you to start to think about that and collect those sorts of stories that you can use and find transference of authority inside of your organization or with the customers that you're working with. So the other really important thing that I want to tell you about authority, because this one is hard, it's challenging to use, is if you can admit shortcomings in an honest way, people will trust you more. They'll start to see you as an authority. So you can say something like, I know the learning curve is going to be steep. I know it's going to take you a little bit of time to change your mind, but here's the benefits. Let me tell you something that has definitely happened to you once before. You've gone out to eat and you look at the menu and it's extensive and you say, I don't know, I've never been here before. And what I don't want to do is pay $24 for something I'm not going to like. So I'm going to ask the person who's waiting at my table and I'm going to say, you know, what do you think about the beef? And if they say, yeah, the beef isn't as good today as it usually is, but I'll tell you what looks great today, the fish, you're immediately going to trust them and say, well, what an honest and trustworthy person. And there are potentially some charlatans who will use this against you. There's a really good story in this book about a person who would always lead with that. And then later they would sell desserts and expensive after dinner drinks, but they would gain trust of people by saying, here are some shortcomings." And I'll tell you what, one of the things that I think all of us, many of us have struggled with, if you've been around for a couple of years, and if you haven't, you probably have heard the story of trying to get your users from Salesforce Classic into Salesforce Lightning because that was a bend of psychology, right? So people were saying, no, they never liked Salesforce before. They would stand in line to tell you how much they couldn't stand and didn't like to use it. And it was too hard for them to do. But I'll tell you what, as soon as Lightning came out, they loved Classic. <laughs> so people who did not like it before suddenly were like drawing, writing their name with little hearts around it, like me and Classic, true love always, right? So one of the things that you can do to find authority whenever somebody's saying, yeah, you know what? I don't think I want to change that. You come out and say, I get it. I totally understand it. You've got muscle memory for classic. There are things you really like in there. You hate to give that up. You're used to the way it looks and feels. It's going to take a little bit of time. It took me a little bit of time too. But we can do it together and you'll find that once you transition into lightning, you're going to get some time back. You're going to find things that you love and you're going to forget about that old abusive relationship with classic, right? <laughs> so find ways to be truthful and honest because painting a really rosy picture and all five stars reviews are hard to believe something had to go wrong with somebody somewhere all right so that was your fourth one we're going to move on to the fifth one which is scarcity scarcity is the rule of the few you have seen scarcity in action. I guarantee you have seen scarcity in action before. So scarcity is when there's limited numbers or there's limited time. You've seen this where there's the ticking time clock on a checkout page, like you better hurry up and buy these tickets to this concert, Brad, or else they're gonna sell out because 337 other people are also looking at this right now. And you're like, woof, we better hurry up and buy them. <laughs> you know, We're gonna do that. You understand the co concept of scarcity. So one of the ways that you can use this as a Salesforce professional is to say, how can I think about the psychological reactants? And that sounds like a lot of syllables, but all it is is saying, how can I let people know that there will be some freedom restriction? Because it will immediately make them say, I need to take the action that you're trying to get me to take based on this concept of scarcity. This is one I will warn you is <laughs> one that you will see employed in ways that aren't very ethical and don't feel very good. And I'm going to give you some examples on how to use scarcity in a good, honest way, right? So we can say, you know what? I'm looking for five UAT testers. I only need five. I need five people to try something brand new that I've put. It's in the sandbox. I'll help you through it. I need you to take this through user acceptance testing, take pictures so we can determine, did it return the expected behavior? Those five people, the five people who volunteer, they're actually going to have a nice benefit. They are going to learn something that we're going to roll out to the organization first. They're going to have the, their voice inside of it because they're going to be able to say, I don't want it to behave like that. Or did you ever think about what happens when I'm out in the field and I have to click this 17 times? So those five people actually get a really good benefit. That's scarce, right? Because it's a limited number can't have everybody in the whole organization do user acceptance testing, right? You can only do it with this five. So those people are gonna be clamoring for those spots. 
So you can say, you know, there is just a scarce amount of people that can actually do this. And what that does is it creates optimal conditions. So you can say, here are the ways that we can see that this is going to be optimal for you to come in and help me out with this thing that I'm trying to do. Guess what? Do you ever log into Salesforce and it gives you that little screen and it gives you the box that says the system's being refreshed right now. You can get back in in five minutes. Nobody, nobody has ever wanted to use Salesforce more than in those five minutes that they're not allowed to use Salesforce, right? It's between 2 a.m. and 2.05, but that's a little scarce, right? So the one way that you can use this to your benefit is to think about gamification and leaderboards. This is really, really helpful whenever you've got something that is tracked by numbers. So if you've got a service team that is tracked with turnaround times or the number of cases that they can keep in tier one without kicking to tier two, or if you've got sales users who are looking at the leaderboard to say, I'm looking it to be in the top three salespeople in my territory. But what I will tell you to do if you're going to use scarcity in this way is don't list everybody. Don't list every single person in your service organization because then there's no scarcity. List your top five or list your top 10. Don't list every single person. Think you can make it available in a report. But if you're going to do some sort of leaderboard or some sort of gamification, put it with a limited number because that is the way to do it. All right, so that's scarcity. Next one is one that is so critical. And this one is commitment and consistency. This is from you, Salesforce professional. And it's also from you asking this back from the people who are your users. So commitment and consistency, <laughs> Dr. Cialdini calls them the hobgoblins of the mind. <laughs> so these hobgoblins of the mind, the way you want to think about those is, is there a quick fix? What is the quick fix? And here you want to think about starting small and building. If you've ever listened to one of my talks before about change management, this is the concept of quick wins. So you want to start with something small and you want to build upon it and you want to take credit for those. Not saying like, look at me, I did it at all, but you want to say, here's what we did as an organization or here's something that worked because you can say, I made a commitment to help you be able to do these things in Salesforce with less manual effort, right? So no longer do you have to change the close date on the day that something is marked as close one, we build an automation in there for you. So it's automatically gonna do it. And you tell everybody about it, you remind them about it because you say, I gave you a quick fix and this is a quick win. So this is something that is helpful for you because you don't have to worry about marking your close date down anymore and it's helpful for me because I don't have to chase you. <laughs> it's all over the people in finance because they know when it's time to pay your commission, right? So you sort of have to spread that out. And so what you're doing here with commitment and consistency is you're trying to capture their hearts and minds and you're putting it back in the public eye. So you're saying, yes, we're working with technology. This is a, this is a piece of cloud software, right? It's Salesforce. The reason why we're fanatics about it though is because it did capture our hearts and minds. It did capture us and, and, and it's really public. It's in the public eye, everybody understands it. And so here I will tell you, when you're looking at commitment and consistency, one of the primary tools you can use is the effort extra. So think about how you can give the extra effort and really share it share it, let them know. So one of the ways that I will tell you to do that is number one, and I bet nobody on this call does this, do not push anything straight to production. Put it in your sandbox, test it first, because the fastest way to lose the hearts and minds of your people is to have something break in the middle of their workday when they they are trying to get things done, right? So you say, here's a commitment I'm gonna to make to you. We're gonna test everything we do before we push it onto production. And you're st sitting there on Black Friday, struggling, trying to make sure <laughs> that you can get everything into Salesforce and we can answer all the phone calls we need to and you can make all the prospecting calls that you need to, right? Uh, one of the other ways that you can do this is public commitment. If you've ever been to Dreamforce, and if you haven't, I'm going to tell you exactly what they do there that I think is an absolute brilliant hack of public commitment. Nobody at Salesforce has ever come out to me and told me this is why they do it, but I see it and this is what I see. They've got this beautiful tree in the dream forest 
and they've got these little leaves and you write your name on there and you say something that you're going to do when you get back to the office or something you learned when you're at Dreamforce. And so you write that down and they put it everywhere. It's all over their social media. They tell you, take your picture and your trailblazer hoodie in front of it. And you've written that down and now it's a public commitment. Maybe nobody from your organization seen it. You might be the only one who went to Dreamforce, but you wrote it down and it's public and it's out there. And so one of the ways that you can use this is at the end of a training session, if you jump on the service team's call and you give them a training on how to use something that just came out brand new, you go around and get a sampling of people to say, what's one thing that you took away from this that you're going to do as soon as you get back to your desk? Or you have them actually write it down because as soon as they made that commitment to you in a public way, even if it's actually private, if they just wrote it down for themselves and kept it, they now know they have to deliver on that commitment to you because that's what humans want to do. We want to be consistent and we want to do a good job, right? And this is also a call for organizations to commit, commit to training and optimization. So give time, ask for time, look for ways to say, we have to make sure that our people are up to date on their training so that they can commit back to us and do the things that we need them to do, which is the reason why we got Salesforce in the first place, right? So. We are on our last pillar. And I want to tell you, when this pillar came out, this is a brand new pillar. This pillar is called Unity. And I think this is probably the most challenging pillar. So the difference between the 1984 edition of Influence and the 2021 edition of Influence is this, Unity. This one is really challenging. I think this is the most challenging of all the pillars. But if you can make this one work, you are going to be able to influence the people in your organization or the users that you're working with to do what you need them to do in Salesforce. Here, the we is the shared me. Why is this important? Well, as humans, we're driven to think first about ourselves. So we think about ourselves before we think about the collective we, right? So it's about self-preservation. How do I make sure that I'm doing the best thing for me? And that is okay. How can you use this so that your users will be influenced to do what you want them to do. Well, the first thing is to consider how people consider what is like us versus what is one of us. So what I want you to think about right now is organizations who use the term or understand the term silos. I bet everybody's organization, have you heard that, right? We've got silos all around our organization. In some cases, you may find that there are people who are in different departments who are working on the same problem and aren't aware that there are two tiger teams working on it, right? So here I want you to think about how can you bust those silos? How can you bust down those silos? How can you forge the partnerships and the friendships that will help your organization feel like they belong together and they will act together in the same way, right? So the important thing to remember here is that reciprocal exchange. So you remember the very first pillar was reciprocity. Unity is built off of the pillar of reciprocity. Unity cannot live without reciprocity. How can you make it happen? There are a few ways. I'm going to give you some hacks to do it right now. The first one is how can you find some friends in other departments? Find some people who will give you different opinions than the ones that you already have. So if you are working inside of, like Rachel, a legal department, or if you're working inside of the sales department, how can you find people in other departments to say, with consistency, I'd love to know, what is it that you're working on? What are the things you'd like to see Salesforce give to you? What are the things that are challenging in your department that maybe Salesforce can help you with? Or what are the things that we're creating that are getting in your way, right? Salesforce is brilliant for this, but it may be a best kept secret inside of the department you're working with or the company that you're working with. So look at them to say, how can I bust down those silos by understanding the challenges and the problems that other people have, right? So one of the ways you can do that is by co-creating. You can create with them. And I know you all understand the technical concept of bi-directional information, bi-directional feedback, bi-directional integration. I want you to think about that with the other humans and the other departments that you're working with as well, right? So it's not just us proclaiming, here's what Salesforce does now, and here's how we're gonna use Salesforce. And Salesforce is going to automatically create something for you in your ERP system, and you are the lucky recipient of that. So think about ways that you can bring those other people in. So instead of it being me and me, 
it then becomes we. So if you think about a Venn diagram about yourself or your department and the rest of the organization, how can you keep them as one circle, right? So you wanna bring them together so that they belong together. So if you can co-create together and you don't, it doesn't have to be formal. You don't have to sit down and do an ISO 9000 value stream mapping process. You can just say, all right, let's get together. We can Zoom whiteboard. What are the issues that you're having right now? And, and, and think about ways that Salesforce can help to solve that. So you wanna find ways to ask for advice and feedback. You can do this formally. You can create a custom object inside of Salesforce where people can give you feedback. You can have a bot, you can have a chat bot, you can have ways that they feed it back to you, but you wanna make sure that they understand you receive the feedback. Set up some automation to say, thank you for that feedback. Set up office hours where they can come sit down with you and say, here are the things that I think, and these are the things that I know about the way that Salesforce isn't acting in its optimal manner for the people who are in our project management team. Encourage that sort of thing because then they'll give you what, what you need to know so that you can help to drive unity and that will be your seventh pillar. So before I wrap, I wanna tell you very quickly, um, one more time, all of the seven pillars. Of course, you can find this in this book. I am going to give you my contact information at the end if you want me to send them to you. But the first one is reciprocation. The next one is liking. The third one is social proof. The fourth one is authority. The fifth one is scarcity. The sixth one's commitment and consistency, my favorite and the hardest. And the last one, the newest one is unity. So I wanna thank you so much for joining me and everybody at Send Cal Dream in today. It is a glorious, wonderful day. I have already learned so much. I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. I would love to invite you to please uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, Shannon J. Gregg, connect with me on Twitter. I heard Janet Elliott mention before what an amazing and encouraging and inclusive environment Twitter is, and it really is. You'll find your best place though. I also love the Salesforce Reddit. <laughs> so you'll find the place that's best for you, but please connect with me. Let me know how I can help you and what other psychological helps hacks I can give to you to bring along your users so that they too can be persuaded to love Salesforce exactly as much as you do. Thank you so much.